mercy and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, my fellow redeemed. If you had just looked at the two men, you would have known for sure which one God loved more. The one was rich. He lived a good life. He could afford to celebrate every day. We aren't told about his religious life, and so we can imagine he probably fit in with pious, good Jewish society. He paid his dues. He offered his sacrifices, and everything worked out exactly like it should. He had the life he wanted. The other was, well, he was a little disgusting. They plopped him down at the rich man's palatial gates, and there he begged, hoping for just a few crumbs. He was covered in sores, and only the dogs were willing to keep him company, and then only to lick at those open sores. He had nothing to offer God. He didn't fit into pious society. He didn't fit into any society. People who saw him and passed by probably shook their heads. What a shame. What had this man done to deserve this? It was so clear God must really hate him. Yet, as Jesus tells the story, we learn it was he who trusted in God. In his tough times, really his whole life, he needed an even tougher trust. So he trusted God, and God gave him eternal comfort. David, who wrote our psalm this morning, experienced more than his fair share of tough times. Some of them came from his enemies and the enemies of God's word. Some David seemed to bring upon himself and some God allowed to enter his life to help him and train him, to discipline him in his wild ways. But through them all, David learned what he truly needed. Tough times need tough trust. Trust in God's mercy, in God's history, in God's guidance, and in God's promise. Now, if anyone could have had reason to bargain with God, you would think it would be David. He could say, I have served the Lord my whole life. I have been a warrior for God's people. I am the king, God's anointed one. I have designed the temple of the Lord. I danced in front of the ark. David wrote all those beautiful psalms. And so when he was in his time of need, why shouldn't God help such a great and wonderful person? What a message, an example that would set for all the people to see how God helps someone like David. And more than that, why should someone God's servant like David have to suffer. This kind of bargaining sneaks its way into our own minds. God, I've tried to be as faithful as possible this week, so if you could just. Lord, you know how lovingly I have served you all these years, and so I only ask of you today, Lord, you know how much good they could still do for your kingdom. She tries to do her best. He is doing his best to serve you. So, Lord, if you could just help them out today and at this time, Lord, you know what I could do if you could just give me. We might not speak those words out loud all the time, but they enter our thoughts, they enter our hearts. We try to bargain with God. And we feel that if we really want God's help, well then we should explain why God should help us. 
As Luther died, he whispered these words, We are beggars. That is true. And we know what a beggar looks like, because if you drive pretty much anywhere in the state on nearly any busy street corner, you see the panhandlers sitting there. And what do all those panhandlers have? They have their sign. Their sign that tells you, the driver, why you should help him specifically. And what do people think when they read those signs? Well, enough of those signs are completely made up lies that you begin to doubt all of them. Too many will feed their addiction rather than improve their life. But we got to be honest, none of us knows that for sure. None of you knows anything about that particular person in need to know what they need or what they truly deserve. We are beggars. And so I ask you, what's on your sign? Does it really even matter? Because while we don't know anything about their lives, what doesn't God know about us? Does he not know all that we have done? Does he not know everything that we deserve? Does anyone know better than God all the help that we have already received from his hand? Is there a way for us to hide our wrongs? Or embellish all of our good qualities and somehow slip that past the Lord so he'll help us by accident? Does anyone know better? Doesn't God know better even than ourselves how we will squander every good gift that he could possibly give us? And yet behind this desire we have to show how worthy we are of God's care and his help is that fear. You know, maybe I deserve this bad time. Maybe this is God's way of punishing me for what I have done. David had seen his faults. He carried the full weight of all of his sins and the guilt from time to time. And so he doesn't even bother telling God how worthy he is for his answer and for his help. No, David cries out, Lord! Hear my prayer. Give ear to my cry for mercy. Not look at how I have been faithful, but in your faithfulness. Not because of my righteousness, but answer me in your righteousness. He knows how God could answer. How, from a worldly perspective, God should answer a sinner like him. Sinners like us, sinners like all people, for no one living can be righteous before you, O Lord. And so David prays, do not bring charges against your servant. Do not come with your judgment. David doesn't base his prayer on his prayer of trust on who he is, but on who God is. Not on his worthiness, but on God's great mercy. Lord, hear my prayer. Give ear to my cry for mercy. In your tough times, you have no need to convince God how worthy you may be of his help. In your tough times, you don't have to tell God all the ways that you will somehow serve him if he just gets you out of this jam. In your tough times, you do not need to fear that God is punishing, for you, punishing you for your past sins. In your tough times, your trust is not in your worthiness. Not in a way that you will change your life. Not in your ability to bargain and convince the Lord. Your trust is in God's mercy. 
And that is a tough trust. Because God's mercy never fails. Because God's mercy is new every morning. Because God's mercy always persists, always comes, always hears, always helps, always forgives. The Lord does not come to you in judgment. He comes in his mercy. He comes to answer. He comes to forgive. He comes to help you in all of your tough times. He will never let you down. But the truth is, you can't touch or measure mercy, can you? You can't really be certain of mercy until after that mercy has been given. And so David knew how much he needed God's mercy. And yet, his enemy, he says, the enemy, pursued his soul, crushed the life out of him, brought him into despair to the darkest places. Yes, God's mercy was his greatest comfort. But when faced with the very real, the concrete, the burden, the weight of that tough time, that mercy seems so far away. So where does David look for certainty? He says, I remember the days long ago. I meditate on all your works. I consider what your hands have done. David looked with his trust at God's history. How he was with Abraham taking him out of those foolish times and those foolish situations and making him the father of many nations. How the Lord was with Joseph, or was with Jacob, the heel grabber, and helped him even when Jacob was more interested in his own plans and his own schemes. How the Lord was with Joseph in his slavery and in his imprisonment. And he not only saved him, but made him ruler over all of Israel and saved all those starving lambs. The Lord heard the cry of his people for help and came down with a mighty arm to save them. He was with Moses and Joshua and all those judges. And perhaps David looked back at his own life at all the times God had been with him in power and mercy and grace and saved him as well. And so David didn't wonder, David remembered. One of the special joys of working with young people is how everything that is happening right now in this immediate time is the most important and biggest deal ever. And I'm not even talking about the little kids who cry if they get the wrong sippy cup, but older young people. He gets a bad grade and oh, my whole future is ruined. Her friends laughed at her. I can never go out in public again. They break up and my life, it's over. But perhaps it's not just young people. Have we, do we ever really grow out of that? Look at the society around us. We seem to be caught in this constant, agitated feeling of outrage, where every problem is the end of the world, every insult is the worst insult ever, and it seeps into our own souls too, where the troubles going on in our life feel like they will never end, where the villains that we face feel like the worst ever, when the sins that we are struggling with, the guilt we carry right now in this moment seem like they will drag us down forever. And in those times we feel those darkest places and they seem so dark and terrible like we could never escape. And like David, they threaten to crush our souls. Seems like it'll never go away. But God has a different history. When you open the Old Testament, what kind of people do you find? Do you find good people, brave people, people who have their lives all together and they have nothing but smooth sailing and blue skies up ahead of them? Do they face little challenges, weak enemies, tiny little problems? No. God's people face the toughest times. And they endure because 
because God was with them. Or open your New Testament and follow along with Jesus in his ministry. What kind of people surround him? Righteous people, good people, the healthy, the strong, those who don't have a worry in the world and just need a motivational speech so they can go out and seize the day and claim all the blessings that God has set aside just for them. No. All around Jesus are the sinners, the sick, the weak, the outcast, the foolish fishermen, those who seem to have no hope, no place, no joy. Those who have nothing, they follow Jesus and they receive from him everything, even the very kingdom of God. And so, my friends, in our toughest times, remember the days long ago. Tough times need a tough trust, and so your trust is not in an idea or a concept or some vague idealistic hope. Your trust is in God. God who entered history. God who came down to help his people. God who walked this earth in human flesh. God who lived for you. You don't need to wonder about the mercy of God because the cross stands right in front of your eyes. There God died for you. For your sins. There God rose again for your forgiveness, for your salvation. In your toughest times, you have the toughest trust. A God who has demonstrated his love over and over again to you. A God whose love never fails, who always comes to help, who always saves. When I was in basic training, we were being taught the five fundamentals of marksmanship. And one thing that the instructor told me, told us on that day, really stuck with me. He said, all the female soldiers would likely be better shots than most of the male soldiers. And he had a theory about that. You see, all us boys, that's what we were, all us boys already thought we knew how to shoot. And worse yet, most of us had probably been shooting much of our life and all that time shooting with bad habits and bad form and the wrong way. And all those bad habits that were ingrained in us, they are hard to train out and they are quick to return when the pressure is on. I've always liked the phrase, practice makes permanent. Because it's true. But what happens if you are practicing the wrong way? And so we have to ask ourselves, who is training us in the toughest times? Who is showing us the path through those difficulties? Who is helping us in our daily battles against temptation and the devil? Who trains us for battle? That spiritual battle that means our life both now and in eternity. The world around us offers its solutions, its philosophy, its 12 rules for life, its meditation, its comfort, its indulgence, and some of them seem to work. You can feel a little bit of comfort for a time. With a good life philosophy, you can really turn your life around. With a little bit of meditation, you can relax and let go. With a little bit of comfort if you tell yourself that everything will be okay or if you just indulge yourself and go along with the world follow along with what the devil has to say well then all of those tensions that strain our lives and our hearts well they can seem to go away but where do those paths lead what do those paths bring to us they are not the one true path. They are not the way the Lord has given us to go through on the toughest times. They all miss the mark. They lead us away from God's mercy. And so, in tough times, we cannot turn aside from the word, but rather we pray with David, 
Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. In every tough time, my friends, the Lord is there. He is guiding you, teaching you, helping you, keeping you. In every tough time, God's good spirit makes your tough trust permanent. You know how bad things are for the poor beggar in Jesus' story because of what we call him. Poor Lazarus. When poor is part of your name forevermore, your life's pretty bad. Poor Lazarus had only tough times. He was penniless. He could hear the party going on, but he never got to taste a single crumb. He died in misery, and only the dogs missed him. And yet, through it all, Lazarus had that tough trust that never failed him, because his trust was in the promises of the Lord, his life and his salvation. So while the tough times of this life seemed on the outside like they must be unbearable, their pain could not compare to the joys that God had prepared for him. The time spent suffering was only a passing moment in comparison to the eternity of comfort he received by God's grace. We live in a sinful, broken, and cruel world. But like David, we have a trust that cannot fail. We have those certain promises of God. He has promised to hear us in his mercy to come to help us with his love, compassion, faithfulness, and righteousness. We have the history of God where he has demonstrated his love and forgiveness time and time again. We have God's word. In that word, you receive the blessed promise, the very words of God for you, that your sins are all forgiven and life eternal is yours. In this word, you find the only guidance through life's toughest times in that thorny path. A tough trust. It isn't a faith that never wavers, never struggles, or never doubts. A tough trust is one that is placed in the one who never wavers, in the one who always answers, in the one who always helps, always saves, always forgives. In our toughest times, let us join our hearts with David's in praying this prayer of trust. Lord, hear my prayer. Give ear to my cry for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me in your righteousness. Do not bring charges against your servant, because no one can be righteous before you. For the enemy pursues my soul, he crushes my life to the ground. He makes me dwell in dark places like those long dead. My spirit grows faint inside me. Within me my heart is devastated. I remember days long ago. I meditate on all your works, and I consider what your hands have done. I spread out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a weary land. Hurry! Answer me, Lord, my spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, or I will be like those who go down to the pit. Let me hear about your mercy in the morning, for I have put my trust in you. Teach me the way that I should go, for I lift my soul to you. Rescue me from my enemies, O Lord, for I hide myself in you. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. For the sake of your name, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring me out of trouble. In your mercy, wipe out my enemies and destroy all who threaten my life. For I am your servant. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise. Now the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We join now in responding to God's word with the Te Deum. <laughs> 